It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, is my co-host is with me, Andy Grabner. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm good. You just paused there for like, what is Andy? Is he co-host? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I'm good. (laughs) Because I always said, with me, as always... Well, I forget what I said. I said something and I was just like, was that grammatically correct? Every, you know, the funny thing is when I go back and edit these episodes, you hear yourself talk and you hear when you use words wrong or you say the wrong uh, you know, helper word or something and you're just, I just cringe and I'm like, ah, why did I say that? And I'm, you know, I'm not going to go in and overdub them to make myself sound perfect. So for a moment, I paused to try to think of, did I say the right thing? And I think I messed it up, but it doesn't matter. It just shows all of our listeners that, yes, I am human. I'm not a robot, and I talk awfully. <laughs> anyway, Andy, since you asked, <laughs> yeah. how, how's your day going? Uh, it's over, well, pretty much. It's pretty much over. It's 6 p.m. here, and uh, as the time of the recording, there's an interesting thing in our lives, I guess, impacting all of us, uh, which is the COVID mm-hmm. virus. So that's uh, an interesting challenge. I was supposed to go on a ski trip tomorrow, but that got canceled. And mm. uh, that means it gives me more time to work the rest of the week. So, so wonderful. I know. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> all right. But uh, Brian, uh, enough about us and what's happening in our lives. What do you think? Shall we uh, introduce the guest of honor, the reoccurring guest? And, and should I? Recurring. No, I guess reoccurring. Yeah. There's a difference between recurring and reoccurring. And I believe you did use it correctly. Uh, again, I'm very excited about our guest. Uh, now I feel like I always have to say it, but I am. Uh, I'm gonna. That's going to be my running theme for the next few episodes, talking about how excited I am and how obligated I am to be excited. But I really am excited because um, this is a very prestigious guest. Uh, I'm very honored to have her back on. Um, but Andy, you always do the introductions. so Sure. So welcome back to the show, Goranka Biedov. We had her for episode 33 and 34. It's been more than two years where Garanka talked about performance engineering at Facebook and monitoring at Facebook and how DevOps works. And two years have passed, Garanka, and thank you for being back on the show. And I know there's a lot of new things that that we want to talk about today. Hi, Andy. Hi, Brian. Uh, Really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it's been a long time. You know, we, I don't know about Andy, but I often go back to, you know, a very reduced message that you, you put out in some of those podcasts where there was the idea of the developers having to put in all of the criteria, um, you know, with, you know, their success criteria of their build into it. And then if, you know, if it didn't meet it, it would just get smacked down and they would lose their credibility and not, not their, you know, credibility, but their, their uh, standing and releases and priority and, it's always something I, a uh, story I like to relate from that. So uh, thank you for that because it's come in very handy quite often. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I still haven't changed my opinion on that. I think oh. it is incredibly important to ask people before they release what is your success criteria? Because once uh, once we start seeing data and once we start seeing how a new feature or a new product is performing, it is very easy to fall back to like, well, this is exactly what I expected and this is a success. Uh, where ahead of time, people have much different ideas of what is going to happen. Mm. Yeah. And and I got to say, Goranka, you helped me a lot that you don't even know about how much you helped me. But in the last two and a half years or three years, I think the first time we met was three years ago in New Zealand at Whopper. And I remember you talking about uh, performance engineering at Facebook. I believe you gave me some insights into Canary deployment, uh, enlightened us all that didn't know that Canary deployment is primarily done, at least back then, in New Zealand. Uh, And then you also told me about the, uh, you gave me the analogy of with uh, the success criteria and then if the success criteria is met, you really then start optimizing your code. It's like a fix-it ticket. Uh, I think you gave me some analogies. And I've used these analogies over the last three years at a lot of my conference talks. So thank you so much for making it so much easier for me 
to tell the world about canary deployments, uh, about uh, success criteria, about fixing things. And it's really, it was really amazing. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, I think everybody in New Zealand knows that they are the, the yeah. first place where everything gets released. As a matter of fact, I was just in New Zealand again for two weeks. Uh, I love the country uh, and it's my favorite hiking destination. Uh, and so uh, I ended up chatting about things like that with uh, with our guides and so on. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know, we know mm -hmm. everybody deploys. And, and they think it's cool and probably is because some features never see the light of day after New Zealand and they get to see it all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but sometimes it's also painful because a lot of stuff that gets deployed originally gets basically debugged in New Zealand. Mm. So, yeah. So, yeah. so is it is it fair to say that New Zealand would see the good, the bad, and the ugly? Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, which, <laughs> yeah, which was a perfect segue to. Yeah. That's the that's the title. That's the title of your talk at Def One, uh, where Correct. you know, as as the time of the recording, we don't know if it's happening in April or maybe later in the year, but still, um, uh, so Garanka, this is also the reason why we wanted to definitely have you back on the podcast, especially now, um, because you talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of open source. Um, so Correct. this is what, what I would like to hear more about. So I'm, I'm sure you're aware that, you know, when you are talking about technology space in general, and uh, I, I tend to joke about it being a, a religious environment, uh, you know, what is your software religion? Are you... Uh, you know, IntelliJ or Eclipse person, are you Java or C++ person? And uh, we tend to not be realistic and analyze things. It's been one of my uh, frustrations through like whatever, 20, 30 years that I've been in this field. But in reality, um, you always have to look at what is your environment, what are your constraints, and then pick the right tool. There is simply no simple, single right tool that will solve all of your problems. Or if there is, uh, I certainly don't know of it. And uh, I would wonder why it hasn't been deployed all over. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you will meet people who will simply tell you like, well, clearly open source is the solution for everything. I mean, why would you ever either buy from a vendor or why would you ever, you know, contemplate developing something in house for yourself? Or it's like, this is stupid. You should never do that. You should always go open source. And then there is the other faction that says you should never use open source. Open source is always terrible. Open source will always have problems and you should never use it. And I just sort of look at both of those camps and shake my head and go, you know, I cannot believe that you can be that convinced of, of your position and be that wrong, uh, regardless of which one of those two we are talking about. And, um, and so from my perspective, there are pitfalls uh, with using open source software. It's not going to solve all of your problems for free. I always uh, like to quote, I think it was Scott McNeely who said, open source is free only in the sense that a puppy is free, right? You can pick <laughs> up a puppy for free, but then from that point on, you better feed it and give it chats and so on. And it's kind of like that with open source software. Uh, a lot of times I see people saying like, well, I'm just going to use X and it's going to solve all of my problems. And I'm going like, all right, uh, who's going to maintain it on your end? Who is going to be deploying it? Who is going to be analyzing it? Who is going to like, does it even fit on your stack? You know, and uh, and you get back this blank looks of like, well, it's open source. I mean, it's just going to work magically, right? And uh, and that's very frustrating because then they try one open source package and it doesn't work. And then they try the next one and it doesn't work the way they want it. And they try the next one and they leave and say, well, open source simply doesn't work, which is also not correct. Yeah. You know, so I kind of feel like I've had some good experiences uh, where I feel open source really helped us. Uh, put something together very quickly um, and and sort of convinced a whole bunch of people that their internal development um, was basically a wrong thing to do. Uh, I was in that particular situation, I was 
100% convinced that, oh my God, doing internal development is absolutely terrible. And it involved performance testing, right? So uh, I will always argue that anybody who is developing internally, a load generating tool is making a giant mistake. Yeah. Uh, you know, call it whatever you want, but in particular load generating. And then if you add monitoring and other stuff to that, um, you know, people usually call those tools performance tools because when something goes wrong, how will you know if the problem is in your tool or if the problem is in your product? You know, you just will have to figure that out. And that's not a trivial problem. Uh, most cases, I suspect you will have a problem in both places, but you may find one or you may find the other. And uh, it's very easy to write off the problem in the product because you're hoping that that's not what is going on. So in cases like that, uh, I would never write my own uh, load generating tool. I, I don't think that makes sense. Um, now, the question is, which one of the plethora of tools in open source do you use? And... I can't even give you the answer to that question. It really depends on what are you doing and what yeah. is the skill set of the people that will be using this tool. Yeah, I think that's a really important point too, because you know, I, I, Andy and I both have the load testing background and work with other people with that. And a big part of the question is, is you know, what kind, what protocol are you using? What kind of tests do you need to run? All these kind of questions. Um, and I think a lot of this ties into the general idea that we even see when people are looking to move things into the cloud and like, do I move to Kubernetes? Do I move to just standard containers and microservices? Yes. The question is not what tool do I pick? It's what do I need to do and what's going to best get me there? And maybe the answer is, you know, the vendor based one. Maybe even, yes. you know, we even see a lot of times, a lot of people like, oh, we're going to take a lift, every, lift and shift everything in the cloud. And then we have no plans to make, and then we're going to containerize everything and make it all microservices. And then they split it out to 500 microservices that are all making one-to-one -one calls. And they added a bunch of network latency because they thought they were supposed to do that. Whereas like, you need to take that step back and look at like, what are, what's our goal? And let's design around our goal. And I think that that same thing, the point you're probably making there is the same thing comes into whether or not you choose open source vendor or build your own all depends on what do you need and does it Absolutely. exist do you is is the support important for you that you want to pay a vendor is it something that you can just rely on the open source community or nothing out there because you have such a, an edge case uh suffices your needs and you're going to have to just build this in-house oh i would add even more to that yeah. um you're dealing with a different situation depending on who you are as a company i'm going to argue and I am by no means trying to say, oh, my God, unless you work in technology, you are uh, obviously not smart or something like that. Not the case. But there is a very different situation if you are, you know, any one of the fan companies, right? Or if you are a bank or if you are, God forbid, a healthcare provider in the United States. <laughs> it's not just that there is different legal requirements and different risks involved, it is also, you know, what is your expertise? Uh, let's say you're a Citibank. Do you really want to build a team of really good technologists that will do for your company what, for example, you know, uh, different people or internal uh, IT is doing for Facebook or for uh, Google or so on? And I would argue that if you choose to do that, you know, that's that's going to be a tough uh, proposition. And um, you are simply in a different situation. If you're a healthcare company, let's say you're a giant hospital, whether you are the Stanford Healthcare or something like that. Well, holy crap, you are now under all of these laws that... Um, really govern the security of all the data. And you probably have data that goes back, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, which means it's in all different database forms. Um, it, it's a very different situation. And I would say hiring a company that specializes in, um, you know, solving problems like that versus trying to build an internal team that will do it for you uh, I would probably go with hiring expertise. 
anything that isn't my core job, I, I tend to prefer to hire that expertise for as long as I can. It's difficult to develop expertise outside of your core space um, simply because you don't, you know, you don't even know how to interview people for it. You don't even, you, you sort of understand the problem on a very high level, but you don't understand it on all of the levels in between. And now you're trying to hire people that will actually know how to solve the problem that you don't even know how to describe. Um, those are the places where I always feel if I were a company, I would always try to get, you know, the third party security team or the third party performance team or, or even, you know, somebody to do the architecture and do the analysis and tell me, you know, how big of a mess am I in? Mm -hmm. So what's interesting though, and, and I agree with you, but then it's also a little contradictory to what we hear when you go to some of these conferences uh, that I also, I go to and talk at where we say, uh, in order to be com better competitive, you need to in-house a lot of things because that gives you a competitive advantage and you need to build up your own uh, teams that can do delivery, that know how to do CI, CD, that know all these things. Um, and then the challenge with this, obviously, is we're all, as you said earlier, we don't have an unlimited res uh, pool of resources of engineers that we can all of a sudden draw from. And then we struggle and then we we kind of bound to fail right from, from the beginning, it seems, or at least some organizations, because uh, not everybody can hire all these people that we would need to hire in order to build up this expertise. But it's, it's interesting, right? If you go to the DevOps days, if you go to some other conferences, it feels like all these success stories are centered around, hey, we have built this team that is now doing magic for us and now we have the brightest people and you have to replicate this in, in, in case you want to do this as well. So I think you have two cases that I can speak of where I believe that both Facebook and Google have uh, obviously built a lot of stuff internally and I think both have done phenomenal job. Um, I actually think Nobody should look at Facebook and Google and say, well, this is the average case. They're not. They're outliers. And uh, the, uh, the one thing that I uh, remember, especially when I moved from Google to Facebook, is how Facebook's approach was always, um, let's not build it until we really have to, un until we have no other options. And we realized that two or three years down the road, uh, we will basically be stuck unless we solve this problem in-house ourselves. And I think that is a very, very good approach. Um, I think a lot of companies, uh, let me give you a different example, Netflix. Netflix, I, I think very few people would argue that Netflix isn't a successful company. And uh, if somebody's going to take up that argument, I would love to hear it. I think Netflix is incredibly successful. Um, however, Netflix does everything to the best of my knowledge. It does everything on AWS. Uh, most of their stuff is in there. They didn't build their own data centers. They didn't, uh, you know, go the route of Google and Facebook. And when you look at it, you go like, well, why didn't they? Well, because if you really think about it, their core business and their core expertise and where they really want to invest money, and from my understanding of investing, is in creating and managing content. Uh, basically giving people things that people want to watch, even if that includes uh, commissioning and, and creating some of those things themselves. Their core job is not building network all over the world and trying to make sure that they have enough. So instead, uh, I think their teams have, and rightfully so, uh, gone and said, well, who can we get the network from and make it incredibly extensible and available um, and they landed on AWS, and to the best of my knowledge, they're using it to this day. You also have to know that the only stuff that I know about Netflix is not even the third hand, but fourth or fifth. But I think this is one of the reasonably well-known uh, facts about them. And, uh, you know, I obviously have that service in my house, and I certainly have no complaints. Uh, you know, I know some of the things that they've done, obviously, they've, they've put their edges as close to the customer. They've made deals with... Uh, 
you know, uh, service providers uh, to homes and they've put their uh, giant caches and stuff uh, into the like Comcast data centers and so on, which makes perfect sense. But they didn't go and build those things on their own. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't build their own machines. They just basically said, hey, this is good enough. If you a brand new startup right now and you contact me and you say, hey, we'd like to talk with you because we want to build our own machines and we know you were involved with all of that stuff at Facebook. Uh, how do we go about doing that? My first comment is going to be, don't do it. Don't do it. Facebook didn't build its own machines in 2004. The first time Facebook built its own machine was actually in 2011. And at that point in time, it was only one type of a machine. So the first thing that you do is you go into somebody else's data centers. You go into Colo because in 2004, AWS was not a thing, right? Uh, today, I would say, I don't care which one you go, whether it's Azure, or AWS, or Google Cloud, but go in there. Figure out first, is your product going to be success? Or like it happens for majority of the products, will the audience say, eh, don't care? Right. So before you invest all of your money into infrastructure, make sure that you have a product that can actually make money and support that infrastructure. And it's astounding to me that I have to kind of argue this with some people. And it's like, do whatever you like. I'm just telling you what is, in my mind, the only thing that makes sense. So that means what you're saying, if I kind of read, uh, repeat back to you is if Facebook would have started not in 2004, but maybe in 2015 or now, uh, obviously you would have started, well, Facebook would have started most likely also in the public cloud to figure out, is this a product? Is the social network really something that people will need? Absolutely. I would, I would think anything else would be insane. I think you, you have to find the solution that fits the time um, and your circumstances, right? So obviously the whole thing started in a dorm room. Then once uh, Mark ran out of uh, disk space and so on, they started adding some disks and stuff like that. And then eventually you simply had to go to Colo and, uh, you know, put machines in there. That approach lasted for quite a while, I would say. So if they started in 2004, uh, so February 4th is the official uh, Facebook um, incorporation date and so on. And so all the way up to probably 2009, that was the only thing that was planned for. And then you realize, oh my God, this thing is really getting big. Now I need to go and look into what I'm going to do for the next stage. And I can't say when they started looking into that because I joined in 2010. Uh, but I would guess 2008, 2009, um, you know, they probably started looking and saying, hey, you know, if you're going to be renting all of these colo spaces, should we think about buying our own and building our own? And uh, what about the machines? How happy are we with the ones that we can buy and can we do better ourselves? Because I don't think you just make up your mind to do this one day and then in a month you have the solution. And so, you know, somewhere in there they started thinking. And in 2011, they had the first data center and it had uh, a subset of machines. The compute machines were Facebook built and Facebook created Facebook architecture. And uh, the rest of the stuff was still uh, vendor provided. And then over the years, one by one, you know, Facebook is now running on pretty much uh, all of its own hardware, you know, but it all, yeah, it all depends on the circumstances and on the time. I was going to say, Andy, going back to the comment you made about the conferences, um, the thought I had on that, which again, I don't know if it's a hundred percent valid, but the way I interpret that, you know, again, the, the idea people will go to the conferences, tell everyone to build everything their own. Um, I think there's like, a, a combination of things going on there. I was just talking to my old colleague, Francis. Hi, Francis, if you're listening. And we were just talking about the joy of learning, the joy of sharing knowledge, right? And I, and I think a lot of the core of what goes on in conferences is people get themselves in situations and they tinker and they, they learn some things and they figure out how to do some stuff, right? And sometimes it's very, you know, obviously there's the stories where uh, it really takes off in an organization, but I think a lot of a lot of what goes on in the conferences is is knowledge sharing, and sharing that love of, of learning. And when you attend the conferences and when you listen to them, 
hopefully you have in your mindset, all right, this is great stuff to learn, great stuff to uh, absorb. But then you, you know, internally, you have to know how to apply that rationally uh, in your organization and in your system. But obviously, I think at a conference, people get over, a little overzealous just because, you know, maybe you're on stage, it's all exciting and say, this is, this is the best way to go and this is the best way to do things. And it would be interesting to see that part of the message scale back and it really just be about, here's some cool things I learned. So even when I go back to, um, you know, when I, when I learned uh, Python to deploy against the API, like in an automated script, you know, that took me a long time to do. It's a pain in the butt to uh, maintain. You know, anytime the API changes or anything, I got to go back and fix the script and make sure it works. If I had something that could automate that and just like something else that would build it, you know, at that point, I think you you, you look at that situation like, yeah, let me use that tool instead of doing this on my own. But I'm just curious, you know, from both of your point of views at the conferences, do you see it more like people are saying this is the way to do it? Or is it more of a um, sharing what I learned sharing the fun things I, I got to do because I had time to play with these tools and do things? Or do you feel it's really more like do this to be successful? So interesting question. Um, I, I feel that, uh, you know, on a conference stage, I don't think they force you to, they, they kind of forced to say, or they, they don't say it in a way where you feel forced to repeat what they've done. But sometimes it feels it gets really hyped in the conference space. And then maybe if the wrong person hears it, or not the wrong person, but somebody hears it on the wherever they are high up in the organizational chain, they believe then that, hey, because they were successful and these are the business metrics that they showed me on stage, now we need to do this as well. And um, and and they kind of I sometimes feel this might be sometimes misleading. And I think you also made a good point. Sometimes when you get on stage and you talk about your own success, Sometimes we exaggerate, not exaggerate, but maybe nice talk things and don't, well, let's say is only focus on the good things and not on the bad things and therefore yeah. not always giving the perfect true picture. And I'm guilty as charged with this as well sometimes, <laughs> right? Because you want to obviously tell the story in the best way. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, that, that's kind of my, my, my feeling. But I, I want to say it's not that people are saying you have to do this in order to make the same I don't know, 50% performance improvements and blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. So completely agree. Um, one thing I will add is who are the people who are making presentations? And this is a general problem, I think, in both research uh, academic communities, but also in our technology communities. You get to make a presentation if you were successful. Uh, nobody comes on the stage and says, uh, here is the five things that we have tried and all five failed. Uh, and here is why they failed. Because you don't get to give the talk. Nobody's going to invite you to give the talk. You don't get tenure for those kinds of papers and so on. And so who do you get? You get people who have succeeded and who are genuinely excited about it. I think one thing that I will say for my colleagues left and right uh, in the technology space People tend to love what they do. They, they love technology. They love it to bits and they get excited about it. I mean, that's why you have these religious wars because, you know, individuals deeply believe that what they love is the right solution to everything. And so when they are on the stage and they're giving a presentation, I don't think they are faking. I don't think they are lying. They are excitedly talking about something that has been a phenomenal success for them. However, they, by definition, are not the most objective person to analyze and say, oh, this worked because these 15 constraints were all fulfilled and therefore your solution applied, right? Uh, it's very difficult to analyze those kinds of things. And especially if you worked on something for six months or nine months, thinking back to what are those things you know, a year ago that made you choose a particular tool, it can be hard. Uh, and I think we tend to forget that. I, uh, I really wish we had more uh, examples and more presentations of, uh, you know, here's what we tried and this didn't work and here is why it didn't work. Or it worked for a period of time from 20 million users to 500 million users, but then after that, it fell apart. Uh, I think everybody could learn a little bit more about it, but our industry suffers from another problem that I really hope companies start solving. And that is, look, writing code from scratch is fun. 
Okay. When people say programming is hard, what they're talking about maintaining somebody else's code is hard because you have to read their code. And reading code involves trying to understand what another human being thought at a particular point in time when they were writing that line of code. And let's be very honest. Have you seen your own code that you wrote two years ago and went like, what the hell was I thinking? (laughs) Right. And so now you get into the problem of doing that with somebody else's code. Part of the reason why we start solutions from scratch is because we are lazy. It's hard to read somebody else's code. And then we also delusional and go like, of course, this code this crap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a perfect piece of code that will never have any problems and everybody will love. And then after nine months, we launch. And now I don't want to maintain that code anymore. Now I'm just going to dump it onto somebody else and the cycle repeats, right? So there is a certain level of excitement in writing my own code, in getting it to work, in solving a problem, and and not having to spend the hard time of you know maintaining a giant piece or a code base that you're just kind of going like what is this doing why is this going on this way and stuff like that and so um what we should do is also require people and not give them credit until they have spent a year maintaining the feature that they have deployed you can't walk away and then have them give a presentation after that year. Because at that point in time, the information and the experience would be a lot more relevant. You know, it's very easy to be enthusiastic if you happen to be one of those people who, you know, I know the founder, I've been here for a long time, I get to do something new, and then I dump it on a bunch of poor sops that get to maintain it. And let me tell you, every company that I have ever heard of has cases like that. Andy does it all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I suspected that. Hey, I wanted to ask, um, you know, we talked about the pitfalls and benefits, you know, of of the build your own. um, But what are what are the pitfalls of open source? I mean, I know they're they're somewhat obvious, but from from your point of view, uh, you obviously were preparing a talk on this stuff and all. What about the open source side of the house, right? We know if it works well, it's great and, and all that, but what's, what do you really have to look out for? And what are part of the decision uh, matrix that so you think for that? I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. I'm probably going to expand on them um, during the conference. But for example, pick the right tool. And, uh, and that can be a hard problem because a lot of people uh, don't know how to pick a particular tool. Let's assume you want to do some performance testing, load generation, stuff like that, and you want to pick an open source tool. Well, which one are you going to pick? There is probably 15 on the list. And uh, I will tell you the way I pick the tool. I've, I've gotten this reputation as, uh, oh, she's a JMeter advocate and she believes JMeter is better than any other tool and no tool could ever come up to JMeter. Nothing could be further from the truth. JMeter was the right tool for me in 2005, 2006, when I was working at Google because I was transferring my work once I would be done after about a month or two of making sure everything is okay to the QA teams that in many cases didn't have strong programming skills. And so the, the GUI programming interface that JMeter had, which in any programming environment would be a huge detriment and a negative thing, was a huge plus for me, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, I did not necessarily care what was the underlying programming language, but the ability that I could give this script and that even people who are not uh, spending all of their time coding could play with parameters, change things, try them out, maybe add a listener or a sampler or something like that uh, very quickly, and I could bring them up to speed in no time. That was a phenomenal uh, sort of plus thing feature to have. And, uh, you know, at the time I was giving talks about what we've done and how we've done some, you know, components with it. Um, you know, people sort of took it to say, oh, uh, if I'm doing this, I have to use JMeter. And it's like, if you give JMeter to a bunch of really good programmers, I cannot imagine anything that would be more frustrating, to be honest, uh, because it wouldn't be the tool I would choose. 
So be careful, you know, pick the right tool. Uh, the other thing that I will say is very frequently people will come and say, so here's this new open source tool um, and I think it's awesome. Well, how many contributors does it have? Yeah. Three? Are you really going to, you know, basically uh, stake your future on, on three people? Will they stick around? Will they go away? How long has it been around? How many users does it have? So I would always say check how many people are contributing to that particular project. The other thing that is incredibly important is check how well the project is known. And... Uh, uh, here is a plug for this tool that Google developed a very long time ago, and uh, I absolutely love. And for some reason, nobody else has ever heard of or uses, and I will never understand why. Um, uh, you know, you'll also hear now I am a terrible product person, so I have always been completely wrong predicting <laughs> how well a product is going to do. Like, I could not be more wrong. Uh, but anyway, um, there is this product called Google Trends, and uh, you can find it under Google Labs, which sort of exists or don't exist anymore. I don't know. I've been gone for a long time. But basically, Google Trends, let's assume you are analyzing and trying to pick between four or five different tools. Plug in the names for all of those tools, and Google Trends will tell you how many people are searching for that particular term uh, you know, over a period of time or even in particular region and so on. Well, usually one or two of those tools will uh, come up at the top. Uh, caveat, be careful if the tool name is uh, matches a common word. At that point in time, you have to be very careful about how you apply your analysis. But usually you will find out that there are certain tools not because they are better, but just because they have better word of mouth, they have, you know, they're doing better advertising, whatever. But there are certain tools that everybody is adopting. And, uh, and that's a powerful signal because especially if you're doing performance analysis, right? The reason why I'm very much against um, internal tools for performance load generation and so on, if I'm selling a product, um, that has to go to somebody else, let's say Google search appliance. And now I'm trying to tell somebody, okay, my uh, Google search appliance, that particular type can do this many queries per second on this many documents. It is perfectly reasonable for the buyer to say, okay, I'd like to reproduce your results. Could you please give me a script? Oh, uh, yeah, but you see, I'm using my internal tool. Well, that's not a very good solution. If I'm a buyer, I am certainly not going to accept that. Uh, you know, I know that everybody who is selling a product will probably stack some of their searches in some way or the other, and I will want to verify those results. But if I say, sure, here is a JMeter script, uh, you know, you set this up, here's how you run it, it's very easy for them to download JMeter and verify my results. So again, a huge benefit and, uh, in my opinion, a huge plus for stuff like that. Not just that I didn't have to develop the tool, but also it's very easy for me to give it out. And so if I am actually using a product that is used by only five or 10 people around and I'm requiring, let's say, Bank of America, I'm trying to sell something to Bank of America. So the people that have a lot of money and I'm now saying like, well, you know, my, my tool is great, but you now have to jump through these 55 hoops to verify that my results are correct. While at the same time, they're hopefully looking at two or three other vendors and those are coming in there and saying, oh, and here is a self-install, you know, I don't care, um, open STA package that you can run uh, and verify all these things. And, you know, you can see, uh, you know, all of the signatures match. So you don't even have to install any of this stuff. You know, it's all done for you. Well, obviously that person is going to have an advantage over me because, you know, on the receiving end, their IT people probably have a ton of work. Uh, this has just been dropped in their lab. Uh, do they really want to spend 10 days researching and figuring out how to develop a tool that has been around for only three months? And, oh, by the way, the last three builds don't use them, but use this build? No. Uh, so in those cases, I genuinely believe it makes sense to go with a tool that is incredibly well known. And even if you dislike some aspects of it, you always have to look at what is your goal. You know, 
my goal as an engineer is to do what is right for my company. And if that requires me to learn how to use a tool that I would prefer not to deal with, well, you know, it, it's part of being a professional. Yeah. I, I, got, a, I got a question now for you, uh, the million dollar question. So we are, we are, we are Dynatrace. We are also just released an open source project. And uh, it's called Captain, and it's an event. Everybody driven. drink. Everybody <laughs> drink, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's a little game that Brian starts playing with me every time I use the word Captain, drink. Uh, you can have a drink. Um, so we, we started this open source project, and now we are in that stage of kind of making it over the hump. So the question is, how do you in the beginning, when you strongly believe that you have you're, you're solving the right problem problem with this tool, how do you get how do you convince people that are following your rules of how many contributors, how well is the project known, how long has it been around, and they see us and they think, well, this is a great thing, but we don't really know if we should bet on them. So, do you have any advice on 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 how you can make it over the hump and? So keep in mind, you're getting free advice. So it's probably worth what you're paying for it. And also second caveat, I've never been in that situation. So yeah, this is going to be great advice. Yeah. Uh, but you know, what I would do is I would ask people what concerns they have. Um, one of the things that I've learned over again, decades in this industry is if even internally, uh, there is an internal product and people have to come to me and force me to use it, product is crap. It's as simple as that. It is some VP somewhere who has decided that this team is going to get a pass and we will be pushing this stuff on everybody else and people will be grumbling. I am yet to see a software engineer that you will approach and say, hey, here is this thing. It's going to take you 30 seconds and it's going to solve 25% of your problems. Who's going to say like, you know, I really don't want 25% of my problems solved. I would rather enjoy all 100% of them. Uh, no, if you have a good tool, uh, people will use it. A lot of times it happens that people writing the tool do not understand the problem because they are great tool writers. They have their own personal image of what the problem is. And then they go around forcing people to use their tool. Uh, I've seen this many times um, with people coming and saying, here, I have this great load testing environment. And it's like, great. Why are you talking to me? I would never use it. Right. Uh, and well, but it's a great load testing environment and I'm going to get promoted if you're using it. Well, that's not my problem. And your promotion is not the problem that I'm focusing on solving. So, you know, find somebody else. Um, so what I would say is, A, great thing that you have released it. Um, try talking to people that are the most likely users. I'm hoping that you have two or three companies. Usually smaller companies will be more open to moving quickly, right? All you, you know, if you have a company of 15 engineers, all you need is one engineer who is really into it and is working on these types of problems. And then if you find that person and offer them a little bit of handholding, a little bit of extra help, they will more than happily uh, jump on, uh, on board and try the stuff. But then you have to deliver. Like when they come back and say, hey, this thing is not working. And so here is my patch. Uh, and it's not breaking anything else, somebody needs to go and code review that patch and get it merged quickly and push it out and thank the person publicly and credit them and move on forward. Because if you sit on that patch and I'm now waiting, 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 and, uh, you know, I can obviously make my own branch and, and do the stuff for myself, but you run into the problem that then you release a new version and now I have to remember what are all of the patches and pour them back. Um, I, I think a lot of times uh, it is very important to support the contributors and to actually help them, you know, help you make a better, better product. Thanks for that advice. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, spot on. That's also what we've seen. Unfortunately, we are over that initial hump of we have external contributors. We have uh, the first handful of public referenceable external users, not only internal users, but also external users. But uh, I, I still think that when people come across 
our tool and they try to solve this problem and then maybe they look at, okay, how long has it been around? Oh, only a year and a half. And uh, how many contributors does it have? Okay, it's 10, 15, but there's another tool that has twice the amount. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how can we make something, um, even though we, on some of the numbers, we might not be there yet, still make it appealing enough to try it out. So and then I think your point is, if it is a product that can really solve problems, true, pro, uh, pro, true problems, mm-hmm. and it can be easily evaluated, then uh, most likely people will still see the benefit and then maybe, you know, give a star on GitHub or give a shout out and start contributing. And with that, it may just take off on its own. I have another suggestion. Yeah. Uh, create a subdirectory of uh, examples Mm -hmm. and uh, invite people, you know, where you provide the sample code or, you know, whatever, and invite people to say, hey, uh, we've done this example for this, this example for this. Do you have an example that would help you evaluate the tool uh, more quickly and so on? Uh, You know, ping us, send us a note, and uh, we'll try to support you as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then provide a couple of simple examples so that people can, I think it is much more satisfying to download the stuff and have something running by the end of the day. And let's face it, all of us tend to start doing something brand new by looking at sample code. So having examples of like, hey, here is how you you know, generate some HTTP traffic or HTTPS traffic or, you know... I don't know what else people do, to to be honest. Um, But those kinds of things that they could literally download, start up, and start running all on their uh, laptop Mm -hmm. within a day, Mm -hmm. I think that would help. Mm -hmm. I think that's great, too. And, Andy, what I was going to say, too, the things I've learned from Captain um, in terms of how I would in the future, look at open source tools if I ever needed to was number one. And I think you do have those examples out there, which is really, really cool. Um, but I also like the fact that there's a Slack channel, right? So you can go on then to that Slack channel and see what people are talking about. You know, you're not going to necessarily see the people who are using it, experimenting with it in the repo because they're not necessarily contributing. But when you see them in the Slack channel, when you get to see what kind of questions are being asked, what kind of issues people are having, how quickly the supporting team is responding to those. That gives you a really good idea of the trajectory of an open source project or people asking questions and it's sitting around for days before someone gets back to it. Or is there a lot of engagement? Because yeah, I think that's the hugest issue. If you go back to the early days of the smartphones, right? When the app stores were new, a new product would come on. It would be easy to kind of easy, right? To, to get noticed out there nowadays, try getting a new app. If you're not a major app company, out there with a little promotion. Same thing I think goes with open source. Like how do you, you know, if no one's going to pick you because you don't have contributors, well, how do you get contributors? It's, it's the catch 22. Um, but I think there's a lot of those supporting things like Garenko was mentioning, uh, and the things like the Slack channels and all those pieces, uh, that would give you, uh, give a user an understanding of what kind of open source project this is and and the people that are running it, how, how engaged are they with it? Mm Mm-hmm. Agree 100%. I think uh, support through all of the social networks is incredibly powerful. So I would say, interestingly enough, I I don't have a Twitter account. I don't use Twitter, but I do think Twitter uh, tends to be uh, really good for these kinds of things. So people can bring their uh, grievances, problems, questions, and everything else there. I also understand that that kind of puts more work on on the company because somebody has to really follow those uh, accounts, you know, um, similar thing with like Facebook group, open group for it uh, may work reasonably well. Um, Truthfully, the best tool for open source development, in my opinion, uh, has been Google Wave. Uh, Unfortunately, nobody else cared to use it for anything else. But man, that, that tool was fantastic for any kind of group development projects. Um, I actually have no idea what uh, is going on with Veo. I'm assuming it's completely retired and doesn't exist. But um, any place where you can enable other users to also answer questions 
is uh, is a good place. I think Slack is fantastic. Um, love the love the product, even if I am the um, the old style person, you know. But I, I think Slack Slack has a really good product, in my opinion. It uh, it just sort of works. They've done some things right, uh, even though I can't quite put my finger on what is it about it that I like so much. Uh, there is a lot I like. Cool. Hey. Um... Quick question. So the good, the bad, and the ugly of open source. I know you're going to talk about it a lot at the conference, but mm -hmm. we is there any so we we talk, you you explained a little bit about what you would do to pick the right tool. Is there any other advice kind of at the end of the show now um that you wanna give maybe some some highlight of your talk, uh, whether it's the good, the bad or the ugly. Something that when people are start looking into Open source, yes or no? Shall we shall we use this library or shall we build it our own? Is there any other thing you want to share? So one thing that comes to mind on the don't do this um, uh, side, and I know uh, Facebook has been accused of it on occasion, is uh, if you're a large company and you release something in open source, as you guys have done right now, don't make it just your project. Uh, go and... Um, you know, look for contributors, look for people that will, uh, you know, pitch in and listen for feedback. You may be large, you may be, you know, fantastic, and you may know what you need. But if you're putting something into open source, the fundamental motivation should be to help other people and to actually share this with other people, which means you have to accept other people's input. If it's open source and you're not listening to anybody, that's then that's not really open source. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you claim, well, this is still my backyard and I am going to be the gatekeeper and nobody is going to, you know, send something in without now. me, uh, you know, returning it 15 times and asking for modifications just because. And I'm going to refuse to listen to any feature suggestions and stuff. You know, you are really completely missing what open source is supposed to be about. Cool. Hey, um, Goranka, I I know you are, you love hiking and I know you just said that you are just hiked a lot in New Zealand. I am really though looking forward to having you in Austria because I know there's a lot of cool places to hike here as well. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I hope that, uh, you know, whenever we will see uh, when when the fun is really going to happen but whether it's in the spring as it is settled right now or whether it's in the fall um it's going to be it's going to be great having you back in Linz and um i think it's been it's going to be your first time in Linz so you have have you been here i have never been in Linz um i've i've obviously been what is surprising to me is that it's really not that far away and not that far off of salzburg and obviously i've been to salzburg you know um, mm -hmm. but, uh, really looking forward to it. And I will tell you, I am planning, uh, I still have tour, uh, tour de Mont Blanc on my, um, uh, hiking list. So, uh, it's definitely going to happen at some point in time. So, uh, there is a lot of phenomenal hikes in that whole area, Alps, Dolomites, right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Very cool. Brian, is there anything else that you want to have covered before we summon the summarator? No, I think I'm good. I think we got a lot of great stuff out of this. Mm -hmm. So why don't we go ahead and summon so, the summarator? Do it yeah. now. All right. So, uh, Goranka, as you may remember, at the end, I'll try to summarize the uh, what I've learned uh, at, the, at the podcast. Now, first of all, what I learned is that in the beginning, you started off with uh, open source versus non-open source. It feels like the religious war of like uh, Windows or Linux or... So I think this is obviously not the right way of looking into this if we just have these completely opposite sides of thinking. Um, I think as you made clear, it always depends on your situation and your environment. I believe you have to figure out what is the problem that you need to solve and then figure out what can help you solve the problem. One thing, one term that I wrote down in my notes uh, is... Whatever you do, whether it's going to be open source or whether you build it yourself, you always have to evaluate in the beginning maybe the total cost of ownership. So how long, you know, what's the 
what's maybe the initial cost, but also what's going to be the running costs if I decide to build something myself or if I use open source or if I decide to, um, to, to, to in-house a service from somebody else. I think total cost of ownership in the end to solve the problem is a big thing. Also, thank you so much for the uh, ideas on you know how to pick a tool. You gave a great example with uh, JMeter, while JMeter for you worked pretty well back then because you could hand it off to somebody that is not in deep into code every day. It might be completely frustrating to somebody that is coding every day and then working with JMeter might be a frustrating experience because there's other ways for them to, to get to solve their problems. Um, and just in the end, I really like the, the thing, don't do this. Uh, if you're starting an open source project, don't just make the project to solve your problem, but really make sure it solves problems also of the people that should benefit from the open source project. These are external folks. If you solve problems that help them as well, you will be more accepted, you will get more contributions, and this is the road to success and not if you just solve a problem that you have internally. I think... These are kind of the highlights. And um, yeah, and as I said again, very much looking forward to having you at F1. I really hope we still meet in uh, April. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah. a pretty good summary. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a talent. And when I just had this thought that it would have been awesome if we did have the video, if we did have video accompanying this, because I would really love for Andy to do his summar summaries while dancing. <laughs> Uh, I just think that would really put it over the top. Like, just, you know, do some salsa. Like, one. Anyway, um, that, Garenka, thank you so, so very much for coming on. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you back. Uh, I do want to mention to any of our listeners, you know, I don't know, I think this is going to be airing towards the end of April, maybe very early May. Um, but, you know, not knowing where things are going to be with the whole coronavirus thing. Um, again, if you do have a. Uh, if you did have a, a talk canceled because conferences are being canceled and you don't have a way to present this and you've already done all the work, um, if you want to present it in a podcast format, we'd love to have you on and share it. Um, you know, obviously there won't be any visual aids to be able to assist with it, and we don't really care if it's um, not completely on topic on the performance side. We just really want to, you know, a lot of people did a lot of work, uh, especially the new time speakers, to to get things ready for conferences, and some of our being. Uh, delayed indefinitely so if you are in that situation and you like to at least talk about it and get it out there get in touch with us you can get in touch with us at pure underscore dt on twitter or grabner andy on twitter or i'm on emperor wilson or you can send us an email at pureperformance at dynatrace.com so if you're in that situation let us know if not well hey maybe you'll get to be at a conference sometime in the future or just keep up the great work and we appreciate all your listeners and um, yeah, well, thanks again, Granker. Awesome, awesome having you back on. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon again. Thank you for the invite, guys. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.